All right. So our initial change, Earth has warmed. But what does that actually mean? What are the consequences of that warming? Well, I'm going to take this in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about the positive feedbacks that that either has or could trigger. And then I'm going to translate it to, or then I'm going to look at negative feedbacks that have been triggered. And then at the end, we're going to kind of tie it together and look at sort of the net results. So here we go. So as a result, because Earth has warmed, what are some things that have changed? Um, right here, this is just evidence that glaciers have melted. Um, this is an image of the Penderson Glacier in Alaska. And in 1970 down here, you can actually, 1917, sorry, 1917, if you notice there is a lot of ice, there's a lot of glacial advance. It is a very, very cold, very, very Arctic region. Um, meanwhile, in 2005, that same region is now substantially less iced. And in fact, now you see grass growing and you see tundra, um, but also just really quickly, just to prove that these are the same regions, right here and right here are the same. So that's just, that's just to point that out. Um, and we actually know that glaciers have a really high albedo. And in fact, all ice has a really high albedo. So basically what happens is as Earth's temperature rises, ice melts. Well, ice has a high albedo. So basically as ice is melting, that means that the surface of the Earth on average is becoming darker and darker and darker. This in a very real sense is like Earth taking off a black t-shirt, or sorry, taking off a white t-shirt and replacing it with the black t-shirt, like the Darth Vader shirt I'm wearing right now. Um, so that is basically what one thing that Earth has been doing in response to heating. Ice is melting and that is actually lowering Earth's albedo. So Earth warms, ice melts. What happens next? Well, Ice has a really high albedo, and when it melts, what's left behind, whether it is the ocean in the case of sea ice or um, bare land or grassland in the case of land ice, what's left behind is a darker surface. Albedo declines in that case. As a result, if you remember, the higher the albedo, the more sunlight is reflected. Well, the opposite is true too. The lower the albedo, the less sunlight is reflected. And the less sunlight being reflected actually means the more sunlight that's being absorbed. So basically, as all of this ice melts, Earth actually absorbs more sunlight. Well, when something absorbs more sunlight, I mean, go outside, um, stand out in the sun, and absorb some sunlight, what are you going to feel? going to feel warmer. Well, the same thing is true here. As a result, Earth's temperature actually goes up. Earth absorbs more sunlight, therefore Earth's temperature goes up. The result in this case, warming leads to more warming. Warming leads to more warming. So the initial disturbance was that Earth warmed, and then via these steps, melting of ice, lowering of albedo, increasing absorption, and therefore increasing in Earth's temperature, goes full circle back to more warming. So in this case, warming leads to more warming. This is a positive feedback loop. And this can actually happen really, really fast. So this is a positive feedback loop. So melting of ice leads to more heating. Melting of ice leads to more heating. So, and it can happen really, really, really fast. Um, just as a point to actually make, um, I actually recorded a video, it's not showing up on my screen right now, 
Um, but I'm actually going to link it in the description for this video. Um, and basically what it is, is it's me outside of my apartment. I've got a white sheet on the ground and that sort of represents ice. Well, as Earth is warming up, the amount of ice is melting, it's decreasing. And in fact, the next image I show is actually a video from NASA that actually shows that. Um, well, what happens is as I begin to pull back that sheet, the temperature of the newly exposed land quickly begins to increase. And so this process can actually happen really rapidly. And this is rapidly melting. Um, so this is a video I have right here from NASA. Um, they know a thing or two about its climate. And so what I'm actually gonna do, hopefully they won't copyright ding me on this, but what I'm actually gonna do right now is play this video. And um, I'll link it as well in my, um, in my recording, in my YouTube video so that you can see it there as well. Um, but here it is. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it okay. In this animation, we're taking Arctic sea ice into the third dimension. Here, we're looking at the ice age, which is an indicator of thickness. Generally, older ice is thicker ice. And so what you see in this animation is first of all, the ice pulsing out and in with the seasons. And in winter, the ice grows out and expands outward. In summer, it contracts inward as it melts. In addition, you see the whiter ice, which is the older ice, moving around the Arctic, being pushed around by winds and currents that move the ice. And what you can see is over the years, the ice pulses around and it moves around towards the top along the coast of Greenland. You see that the older ice eventually moves out of the Arctic and into the North Atlantic where it melts. But the ice gets replenished within the Arctic because some of the ice survives each summer and, and grows older. And particularly in a region north of Alaska called the Beaufort Sea, where the ice spins around in a clockwise direction called the Beaufort Gyre. And that ice can keep spinning around oftentimes for several years and gradually getting older and thus getting thicker. Eventually, the ice will spin out of that gyre and go out through Fram Strait. But in the past, what has happened, we've always had enough ice growth and ice aging, enough ice surviving the, the summers to replenish the older ice that's lost. But in recent years, we've seen less replenishment. There, there's been more melt during the summer. And so the ice that goes out through Fram Strait has not been compensated by the ice growth. In addition, especially in recent years, we've seen some pretty remarkable things in the, in the Beaufort Sea, where that area that used to be a nursery for the development of the older ice, allow the, the young ice to age and mature. What we've seen instead is the ice is now more broken up, more scattered, and that's allowing the older ice to melt within the Beaufort Sea. So we're seeing the Beaufort Sea go from a nursery to a graveyard for older ice. And as we get towards the, the more recent years, much of that oldest ice, the ice that's older than five years old in the bright white, has almost virtually disappeared from the Arctic Ocean. And the Arctic is now dominated by younger and thinner ice. So over the last few decades, um, we've gotten to the situation where Earth's ice, especially near the North Pole, has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And um, newer processes, newer processes that happen in the wintertime that allow for ice to regrow, just haven't been cutting it. And so in essence, what's been happening is that our polar ice has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And that is causing Earth's albedo to decline, causing Earth to absorb more heat. And that actually triggers even more ice melting. And then more ice melting, and then more ice melting. And so it actually becomes a pretty scary reality. It actually becomes a pretty scary reality. Now, what else has changed? Um, so ice has melted and that's definitely triggered more warming. Um, but as we've become a lot warmer over the past roughly um, 
three, four decades, we've also seen a pretty noticeable increase in the amount of fires. Um, if you live in the Bay Area um, at the time that I'm recording this video in 2021, we are just coming from what was one of the worst fire seasons in history. We've been hearing that a lot lately, actually. 2020 was the worst fire season in history. 2018, before that, was the worst fire season in history. 2017, before that, was the worst fire season in history. Um, fires are becoming more and more and more common. Now, with that being said, the more fires we get, the more trees that are being burnt, the more oxidation that is occurring, the more carbon dioxide is being released into our atmosphere. So a forest fire is basically a giant oxidation of organic material. And so um, I'm going to do this as sort of a dedication to my chemistry friends. Um, so I'm going to actually balance this equation really quickly for all of my friends who are in chemistry, like, wait, Terrence, you gotta balance that equation. Um, when you have molecular oxygen, which is O2, combined with molecular carbon, that is C2, on the other hand, you get fire, or sorry, but, and then you add some fire into that. So oxygen plus carbon plus fire equals carbon dioxide. Now, just to make sure that I'm properly balancing this equation, you would have two molecules of molecular oxygen, one molecule of molecular carbon plus fire. On the other end, you actually have two molecules of carbon dioxide um, that come out the other end. Um, and so you have four molecules of oxygen, two molecules of carbon. Over here, you have two molecules of carbon and then two times two, four molecules of oxygen. Um, so it all balances out. Um, that's just for my chemistry friends. But the idea is, is that a forest fire or any kind of basically a rapid oxidation of carbon. And so basically what happens is more fires mean more carbon dioxide. More fires mean more carbon dioxide. And more carbon dioxide, guess what that's going to mean? More enhanced greenhouse effect, more warming. So earth warms, the number of fires increases, more carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere. The greenhouse effect is enhanced, earth warms again. So in this case, once again, earth warming leads to more burning, more carbon dioxide, enhanced greenhouse effect, more warming, Oops, sorry. And therefore more fires and more carbon dioxide. And this is actually happening. Now, to be honest though, it's not as concerning here in the United States. The place where it's happening the most and where it's the most concerning is actually the Amazon rainforest. Um, a combination of increased drought and increased biomass burning um, due to deforestation and so on has actually resulted in a large, large, large increase of forest fires in the Amazon rainforest. And what has been suggested by um, Carlos Nobre, a climate scientist um, of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, home of the bulk of the Amazon rainforest, um, is that if we continue to see the amount of burning that we have seen for the next 10 to 15 years, the southern part of the Amazon may actually no longer become a rainforest. It may transition into a savanna. So in essence, this could shrink the Amazon rainforest. That would endanger all the tribes that live there. And that would also greatly remove a major carbon sink that we have on earth. Um, some people called it the lungs of the earth. Um, that's, a little hyper, uh, that's a little hyperbolic. Um, I would be more concerned about phytoplankton in the oceans. Those are more like the lungs of the earth. Um, but losing the Amazon would be a major catastrophe and would really cause some pretty big issues. Um, just really quickly, some other positive feedbacks. Um, our warming earth increases evaporation. Um, a warmer world is a wetter world. 
I'm actually going to cover that more in the next few modules. A warmer world is a wetter world. But water is a greenhouse gas. As a result, that enhances water's greenhouse effect. Um, it also melts permafrost. So in addition to glaciers and tundra, there's also permafrost in the, um, in the Arctic regions that is also undergoing melting. And that permafrost has a lot of methane stored in it from bacterial decomposition. So what happens is if we see the melting of permafrost, that could cause methane burps. Um, and methane is a really potent greenhouse gas. Other concerning things include changes in precipitation patterns. I do mention, and I just mentioned, a warmer world is a wetter world. That is totally true. But there will be winners and losers. Some places are going to get a lot drier, specifically in the mid latitudes. Well, drought re leads to vegetation death, which releases more carbon dioxide, which further heats the earth up. Now, on the other hand, just to show that positive feedbacks don't always mean warming, a cooling period can also trigger a positive feedback. If Earth cooled, we would see ice grow. Ice growing would result in a higher albedo, resulting in less sunlight being absorbed, more growth. This has actually led to previous snowball Earths. If you remember when we talked about the history of Earth's climate, I did briefly talk about snowball Earths. This idea that a little bit of glacier growth results in more cooling, which results in more glacier growth, which results in more, more cooling. Um, and obviously, any of these feedbacks, just like that ball, eventually that ball is going to reach the bottom of the hill. Well, um, eventually something else is triggered that causes these things to level off. In some cases, that trigger might be running out of space to glaciate such as in the case of Snowball Earth. Um, but yeah, changes in precipitation patterns. I'm gonna talk more about this in a few modules, but um, the equatorial oceans, as well as parts of the Sahara Desert, um, parts of the Arabian Desert, and then the North and South Poles are going to see a lot more precipitation. Whereas the mid-latitudes, um, and the subtropics, places such as interior Mexico, um, the Amazon rainforest, South Africa, parts of the US West Coast, are expected to see um, a loss of as much as 20 to 30% in rainfall. And when you live here in California, when you don't already get a lot of rain, having to cut that back by 20 to 30% with a growing population and more brush and more forests, that could actually cause some pretty big issues. Uh, melting in permafrost, this is just um, an area of permafrost that has been melting and these little methane bubbles that have been popping up. Um, I do wanna mention that there's still some uncertainty in how much methane is being released. Um, specifically during the colder seasons, this is a, an article from, um, from Nature Geoscience that actually suggested that there may actually be um, less methane being burped out um, during cold periods, during winter periods. Um, but that could actually lead to increased releases in the summertime. So there's still some uncertainty. But once again, it is alarming. Um, that being said, I will share some good news about possible negative feedbacks that could kick in um, in the next video.